this is Robin on the Road, your concierge for all things travel, and today I'd like to take you on the road with me to Farmville, Virginia, and the Robert Russo Mountain Museum. Come on, let's go. One of the most amazing things about being on the road is when you come across something you did not anticipate. On a recent on-the-road trip to Farmville, Virginia, I came across a sign out front of a church stating that Dr. Martin Luther King had spoken there. Immediately, I was intrigued. Why would Dr. King come to a small area, small farm community like Farmville? Crossing the street to the AME Church, there was an information board that discussed how African American students had walked out of their high school in protest of conditions. This was going to become one of the five cases that will be part of Brown versus Board of Education. Fortunately, the town of Farmville has preserved that high school and the story that the museum tells there is absolutely stunning. In the 1896 decision, in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that schools could be kept separate but equal. Robert Russo Lawton High School was built in 1939 as the public high school for African American students of Prince Edward County. Initially built to house 180 students, it will swell to 450 students. Although the promise may be separate but equal, the school has no gym, no cafeteria, no science labs, no athletic field. In 1949, in order to accommodate the additional students, several freestanding buildings made of plywood and tar paper will be put up. The roof leaks. There's no indoor plumbing. The school's rooms are beastly hot during the summer, and in the winter, they are heated with a single pot-bellied stove. For the students who are close to the stove, it's extremely hot. For everyone else away from it, it's freezing cold. In April of 1951, fed up with the treatment, the students will assemble. They are led by 16-year-old Barbara Johns. Their demands are for new facilities, that the tar paper shacks get torn down. This is not a desegregation rally. Today, the story of these students and the struggle for equality are told in the original Robert Russo Martin High School. Originally closed in 1993, it was declared a National Historic Landmark in 98 and houses the permanent exhibit, The Martin School Story, Children of Courage. I'd like to take you on the road with me and tell you about this amazing museum. Open 12 to 4, Monday through Friday, the museum is free to attend. The tour begins in the old auditorium, and the museum is broken down into six separate areas. Gallery 1 is the assembly hall where on April 23, 1951, Junior Barbara Johns will gather her fellow students and convince them to strike over inadequate conditions and overcrowding. They want the tar paper shacks torn down and new facilities built. Gallery 2, Tar Paper Shacks, begins with the promises of a government to all of its people as we wrestle with the ideals we hope for and the realities of our failure. Showing the mindset of the Southern Democrat Party, the Virginia Constitution allowed for unequally financed schools and students used cast-off books and lab equipment. Set against the backdrop of 1951 Farmville, we begin to get a picture of what life was like for the black residents of Prince Edward County from W.E.B. Du Bois, an early leader of the NAACP. He was a social scientist and recorded his findings to the U.S. Department of Labor in 1898. Built in 1939, the school is named after Robert Rusa Martin an amazing man who was raised in Prince Edward County. He will serve as second president of the Tuskegee Institute from 1915 to 1935. He believed that education was the key to advancement. School was conducted in what one passerby will mistakenly call chicken coops. And yet the students will thrive in a nurturing environment. 
in which parents, teachers, local clergy encourage and challenge the students, but they will also lobby the local school board for better facilities and opportunities. Raising expectation is a success in World War II and the veteran from that war who work at the school. A major change comes for the students in March 19, 1951 when a school bus having to travel to the western part of the county is hit by a train on a rainy and foggy day. Of the 23 students, 10 were hospitalized and 5 will lose their life. Within a month, Barbara John calls for the student assembly. Gallery 3, Davis versus Prince Edward. Originally, the students and parents took their complaint to the Prince Edward School Board, but received the same runaround. Within two days, they contacted the Virginia NAACP and lawyers Oliver W. Hill and Spotswood W. Robinson III. The Virginia NAACP had been fighting segregation in Virginia county by county, but this proved extremely expensive and time-consuming. They decided they needed to take one case before the Supreme Court. They had two requests of the students. First, they understand that this issue was not about getting new facilities, but ending segregation, and that the parents had to agree. The case is filed May 23, 1951 and heard in the Federal District Court in Richmond, Virginia in February of 1952. County lawyers will receive help from Democrat Attorney General J. Lindsay Almond. The evidence is staggering. A three-judge panel will order an end to the discrimination but uphold segregation. With an appeal, the case will join five other cases to appear in front of the Supreme Court. Prince Edward is the only case brought by students. The other cases are from South Carolina, Delaware, Washington, D.C., with the bundle falling under Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Arguments will be heard by the Warren Court in December 1952 and December 1953. On May 17, 1954, the court rules segregation unconstitutional. Chief Justice Warren writes, Separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. An additional hearing in May of 1955, known as Brown II, will answer the question of implementation and orders to admit public schools on a racially non-discriminate basis with all deliberate speed the parties to these cases. While the country is changing and moving forward, not surprisingly, in the South and Virginia, they respond to this news by digging in their heels, watching what happens in Arkansas with screaming crowds and military personnel, Virginia moves in a very different direction. The Virginia Democrats are led by Harry F. Byrd, a man who was twice elected Virginia governor and was serving as its U.S. Senator at the time. With regard to segregation, Byrd will write that it is the most serious crisis that has occurred since the war between the states. He orchestrates the writing of the Southern Manifesto, which will be signed by 101 congressmen, including Virginia's entire delegation. With 
the declaration labeled Brown a clear abuse of judicial power, and it will pledge to commit to use all lawful means to overturn this decision. Byrd will be joined by citizen groups like the Defenders of State Sovereignty and Individual Liberties, and newspaper men like editor J. Barry Wall of the Richmond Newsleader. They will form what becomes known as Massive Resistance. In 1956, the Virginia General Assembly grants power to the Virginia Governor to close schools, named the Stanley Plan after then Governor Thomas Stanley. Stanley will appoint Senator Garland Gray to head a panel known as the Virginia Public Education Commission. They will find compulsory integration should be resisted at all proper means in our power. We must leave a large measure of autonomy to the localities even though that may result in the closing of public schools. District Judge Sterling Hutchinson will rule the Prince Edward County has up to 10 years to integrate. Then, in September 1958, Democrat Virginia Governor J. Lindsay Almond closes schools in Norfolk, Charlottesville, and Warren County, leaving 13,000 Virginia children without public education. They will stay closed until January of 1959, when the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals and a federal panel declare the massive resistance laws are invalid. The Allen decision will strike down the ruling from Judge Hutchinson, stating, and I paraphrase, that the ruling on Brown cannot be nullified directly or indirectly through segregation schemes. What must it have been like for people at this time? as they have success with the Supreme Court striking down segregation in 1955. Yet in many parts of the South, and in particular Virginia, the fight continues for another four years. And for Prince Edward County, the fight has yet to end. Up until this room, what occurred during segregation was something I had been taught in school. And while the Southern response is not a surprise, what happened in Prince Edward County shocks and saddens me. With the final ruling in January of 1959 that all massive resistance laws were unconstitutional, the Prince Edward Board of Supervisors refused to fund the schools, effectively closing them. Supported with segregationist money, the Prince Edward Academy opened in the fall of 1959, educating 1,400 white students with a private education, while 1,700 other students were shut out of school completely. Students were sent to other counties and states, but most waited at home for the court's decision. Frustrated with the situation, in 1961 a massive protest occurs at the Prince Edward County Courthouse, while the case Griffin v. County School Board of Prince Edward becomes bogged down in the court, the closure will last for four years. During that time, Dr. Martin Luther King will visit the First Baptist Church to offer encouragement. The Quaker Society, the American Friends Service Community, will set up host families, work to help local needs, and fight to return the children to school. During the summer, college students will volunteer to educate the children. Attorney General Robert Kennedy understood what it meant if Prince Edward County was allowed to continue to defy the court's order of desegregation. In 1963, as the Supreme Court will agree to hear the case, Kennedy appoints New York Attorney William Vanden Hovel, who will work on a year-long plan for free schools for the county's children. 
Neil Sullivan, a Harvard graduate, will be recruited by Havel, and in August of 1963, he will begin the task of finding teachers, books, buses, buildings, and will open five free schools in three weeks. Graduating 23 students in 1964, the free schools concentrate on math, reading, and job skills for older students. Thirteen years after the Davis case is filed, the Supreme Court orders the schools reopen. In the Griffith v. County School Board of Prince Edward County, Associate Justice Hugo Black wrote, The time for mere deliberate speed has run out and that phase can no longer justify denying these children their constitutional right to an education. While I was working on my Robin on the Road Farmville video, I came across the First Baptist Church on Main Street. Noting a visit from Dr. Martin Luther King, I wondered why would a man as important as Dr. King come to this small town church in a farming community? What I learned at the Mott Museum told the story, an American story, with heroes and bad guys. Fortunately, this story has many more heroes than bad guys. Dr. King was just one part of this story, but other men of power also stepped forward in this fight for freedom. Chief Justice Earl Warren worked diligently for a unanimous decision on Brown versus the Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, understanding that separate could never be equal. Appointed by Dwight Eisenhower in 1953, he worked to expand freedom and personal rights for the citizens of the country. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy stepped forward and appointed people to help the students of Prince Edward County while the courts heard and decided on the case. If Prince Edward County was allowed to close the schools in order to preserve segregation, then the South would follow and segregation would be allowed to stand. Lastly, the most powerful of all these men, President John F. Kennedy, moved the country and his own Democrat Party out of Jim Crow ideas toward a future where the promises made applied to all the people, not just those the government deemed worthy. This is noted by the people and the students of Farmville for his push for civil rights and freedom. NAACP lawyer Oliver W. Hill, a graduate of Howard University, vowed to fight for the constitutional rights of his people. He was head of the NAACP in Virginia. Along with Spotswood Robinson III and Martin A. Martin, they will launch their county-by-county -county plan, eventually settling on one case to take before the Supreme Court, Davis versus the County School Board of Prince Edward County. He will stay and fight until the end and the students return to school. While the outcome of segregation may have been altered or dragged out without the influence of these powerful men, the story of the local heroes beginning with the students themselves. Prince Edward was the only case brought forward by students and they never stopped fighting. They protested carrying picket signs, conducting sit-ins, marches, boycotts, and walkouts. They never stopped demanding their right to education. They understood that without education, they didn't have a future. No buildings were burned, and although tension ran high in the town, violence did not break out. While government may have been failing the students, the people did not. Churches got together to provide classrooms. Christian organizations sent volunteers, teachers, resources. Students were placed with host families in other counties and states. Student teachers flocked to the county on weekends and summers in order to keep the students from falling far behind. The driving force that truly stands out is Reverend L. Francis Griffin of the First Baptist Church. He becomes the spiritual leader and spokesman as part of the PTA, local NAACP, Prince Edward County Christian Society, 
He will orchestrate the 1961 rally at the courthouse, and his children will serve as plaintiffs in the trials. Lastly, none of this would have happened without the courage of one 16-year-old girl, Barbara Johns. With the support of her fellow students, their parents, and the church, she took on the Democrat segregation system in Prince Edward County, but also in Virginia, the South, and the country. Fearing for her safety after the strike, her parents sent her to live with her uncle, Reverend Vernon Johns, in Montgomery, Alabama. She will attend Spelman College in Atlanta and graduate from Drexel University in Philadelphia. There she will meet and marry Reverend William Powell. She will raise five children and work as the school librarian and pass away in 1991. The last hero is the one that has a change of heart, and that's Prince Edward County itself, beginning with the Motten Museum. In the 1990s, local citizens, led by Martha E. Forrester and the Council of Women, mobilized to purchase the Motten School. They succeeded in having it declared as a National Historic Landmark and placing it on Virginia Landmark Registry. The museum officially opened in 2001 on the 50th anniversary of the student strike. A volunteer board of directors governs the museum. The Light of Reconciliation now stands on the courthouse steps from the famous 1961 rally, promising that what occurred in Prince Edward County will never happen again. The story of the Mountain School and Prince Edward County is the story of America and the people who live in it, a people who have the right to fight and redress a government when they are no longer serving the people. I highly recommend the Mott Museum, a place that will make you think about who you are and what would you have the courage to fight for. So hit the road. Things to know before you go. Robert Russo Mott Museum is housed in the original school building at 900 Griffith Boulevard in Farmville, Virginia. Open Monday through Saturday, noon to 4. Admission is free and there is a gift shop on site. Plan to spend at least 2-3 to three hours and mobility impaired can be accommodated. A replica of the tar paper shack is on site and available for rent. Donations are welcome. There are several hotels. For a unique stay, I recommend the Hotel Wayanoke, but there is also a Hampton Inn, Holiday Inn Express, and Hilton True. Farmville has some amazing restaurants and I recommend Walker's Diner for breakfast and lunch, Charlie's for the view, and the 119 for fresh Mexican and margaritas. Farmville is home to incredible shopping, outdoor recreation, additional history, and two universities. Lastly, I'd like to thank you, fellow traveler, for joining me at the Robert Russo Mott Museum. Please smack that bell and like my channel as I will be uploading content all the time. This is Robin on the Road, and I hope to see you out there. Until then, safe travels.